Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George. I'm here with my co-hosts, Naomi and John. And as our special guest, we have Dr. Kurt Johnson. Um, I, this episode, we're going to call Causal Dis um, Reality Discussion Number 2. We had one um, several weeks ago. And it's going to be like an open forum to just like just analyze, you know, what we mean by free will. You know, what, what possible um, mechanisms could there be to um, to allow for that, or what possible what me mechanisms would prohibit that? So, um, Nomi, why don't you start us off? What um, what um, what is your basic understanding of, of of the question and your conclusion regarding it? Oh, conclusion, I would like to give at the end. <laughs> but my basic understanding is that necessary and sufficient causality along with the no laws of nature, uh, somehow interact in very complex ways and create emergent phenomena. Uh, how much we understand that emergent uh, emergence is not much, but there definitely is lawful. And even if something awful happens, it is lawful. And the more laws we understand, the better uh, we can predict and we can control and we can explain. But right now, our understanding is limited, and that's why uh, there is room for debate. Okay. Okay, Kurt, so um, considering the, the um, issue of laws, um, do, you, do you first agree with Nomi that, that the universe is lawful, that it, it goes by certain kinds of laws that we may or may not understand mm -hmm. fully? And then secondly, um, would one of those laws be causality? And I guess thirdly, um, if in fact there is a law that, that um, compels causality, what would be the mechanism that would allow for a trend for a um, circumvention of that causality to to allow for a quote unquote free will mm -hmm. yeah, uh, one thing that's worth mentioning is that in the modern philosophy of science, which is post Sir Karl Popper in the 1980s um, it's generally understood that um, I'm losing my train of thought I apologize um, yeah, let's go ahead. Karl Popper, way. you were talking about? Yeah, yeah, but just keep going. I'll come back to it. Yeah, John, what, what, what's your... T um, oh, I got it. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> is that... Yeah, <laughs> really forgive me. Um, that this is all about patterns, and there are individual patterns and there are general patterns. Can you describe exactly what a pattern is? Well, a pattern would be something that you see happening enough that you would infer that there's something regularly unfolding that's repeating itself in in what you're watching, right? Okay. But what science is looking for, and this is where laws come in, what are laws in science? They're general patterns. And they're general patterns which are occurring at such a level of generality that they can be inferred as having a domain over whatever the context is that you're, you're talking about. And so that's actually what laws are, you know, in science. So, I mean, obviously that, that there is causality, that one condition feeds into what then happens after it is certainly a general pattern. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and let's, let's ask the question then, like, let's say, um, for the purpose of the discussion, that there is actually a mechanism that circumvents causality. In such a case, what, how would you describe that mechanism? What, 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 what term or, or name would you give it? Well, you know, this is a discussion that we've been having through all of these... Uh, these get-togethers is, in other words, how do we distinguish this moment at which there's a new combination in phenomena or what could be identified, again, by analysis as a new combination of phenomena, by, like a genetic mutation, which would be a new set of, of, uh, of, uh, of endings on the genome that are active then in developing a pathway. And to what extent do we want to put tags on that, that that's actually free, or to some extent, it's uh, going back to John's, uh, you know, relative condition, or, or you know, it's been there's some set of pathways that's obviously contributed to that. So I keep going back to are 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 we creating artifacts here by our discussion that that become problems that don't need to become problems? We've got a dynamic system. Mm -hmm. There are things that are are setting conditions for things that happen afterwards, but there's also 
obviously eruptions of different patterns, well, maybe we don't want to call them new, but let's say different patterns as those pathways continue. Mm -hmm. Now, do we want to throw the words free or not free around well, about we, that? Uh, you talked know. about uh, monkeys. Uh, a monkey yeah. may discover something and share it with a few other monkeys and then it disappears, whereas humans, even small children, are, seem to be compelled to, to share it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so yeah. that's uh, cult the nature of culture. Right. Um, transmits some of these discoveries and then of course they may become habits and uh, they endure for a while but I'm interested very much in culture and language mm, mm, mm. and um, I'm very uh, I find Mark Turner very interesting because he talks about how uh, language is like a prompt mm. for creating mental spaces. Uh, John, wh how, how does the language on consideration um, relate to the the, the question of, of whether human will is causal. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, well, but I, I do think yeah. that there's uh, these mental spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we juxtapose these mental spaces, mm -hmm. these containers that our minds use to put this information and that information and that information, is that there is a opportunity for a blend to happen. Something novel. This comes from here, here, something new happens. And uh, language invites us to create these spaces, but they disappear very quickly unless it's shared so, or, or here externalized in yeah, some way. Yeah, that's the, why I think yeah, culture there's a whole There's a whole paradigm here. There's, a, there's a, a, an area that's called discursive modalities, and there are people that this is actually their specialty. And this is actually what it is, is that when you use a narrative, when you create language about something, it actually creates a situation in which what's talked about can then manifest. Right. And so, for instance, some of the studies in discursive modalities, they've said, for instance, when Shell Oil was forced to begin green advertising, there was an unanticipated result in Shell Oil that that discourse about going green ended up affecting the policies of Shell Oil in real time. Now, what's interesting about that is that the people who are doing work in discursive modalities, they're saying that's like a morphogenetic field. Mm -hmm. The idea of morphogenetic fields is that you set up something in the subtle realms, and there would be nothing more subtle than language, mm -hmm. because it's a sound and then it's interpreted you know, by, an, by another mind, but that that language about something is actually creating a morphogenetic field to create that possibility that that would manifest. I'll give you a prime example in history. Back when monarchy, when people were, were starting to talk in the, in the uh, cafes of Europe about going from monarchy to some form of republic or democracy, they created a conversation that created the model of a paradigm that then manifested in experiments and behavior in relation to those experiments, which ended up historically then turning the paradigm upside down. So what I found interesting about that is I used to think that morphogenetic fields, that it was hard to find an objective example of morphogenetic fields. And then when I started looking at this literature of discursive modalities, I was saying, wow, that's actually what a morphogenetic okay, field is. Okay, but Kurt, is. bring it around. How, how would that, the morphogenetic fields, um, allow for a free will? How does that somehow circumvent causality? Well, it, 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 it doesn't circumvent causality. I think it's a new discussion about how causality works. Mm -hmm. You know, and, right, and how but, causality becomes all right, but becomes novel. But right, Kurt, but you if, know? If, if, it, um, if it goes along with causality, um, then um, what, what's the relevance? I mean, how, if you're, you're essentially you're saying that it, it can't allow for a free will then. No, I'm, I'm saying, I, th I think, I'm hoping that this conversation is beyond trying to parse out whether we're going to tag things with free or not free. I'm not sure that that serves us. All right, but the, you know, the idea is... I, I, I'm more interested in understanding a pattern of, of, of novelty or creativity. Right. And I was really interested in what you were saying in those uh, All right, cafes but wait, in wait, Vienna. Wait, hold on. When people John, were whoa, talking whoa. about slow democracy. Down, down. All right, the idea is like, we're trying to ferret out the truth. You know, e either we are players, like Shakespeare said, automatons, in a pejorative sense, zombies or not, or not. I mean, you know, there, there is this, this reality, like, we exist, we are here right now having this discussion, or we're not. Now, our conventional understanding is that we are, mm -hmm. okay? We have a shared understanding. So, so when I ask this question, mm -hmm. it's like, 
It's trying to ascertain the truth of, of, of um, human will. And, and one, there are some of us, there's a tradition that says that even though reality is completely causal, by some mechanism we can circumvent that, that causality. We can, we can make choices that are completely up to us. That's, that's the standard tradition. However, there is a mountain of evidence now um, which is based on causality or, or randomness, whatever, that, that says that's impossible. We well, remember in Alice in Wonderland when she's talking to Humpty Dumpty mm -hmm. and she's asked about what a word means and he says, it means whatever I say it means. <laughs> mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. we all know what happened to Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> um, I think that's a, a very uh, interesting metaphor. Yeah, but the, the I, w I wanted to ask you, see, I, I, I really think, you know, that we might be looking for something that doesn't exist. Let me ask, do we go back to the cafe conversations in Europe at the beginning of the end for monarchy? Would it be possible to find one writer or one thinker who actually penned in isolation the first idea of how you might do something different than monarchy? And even if you found that person, could you say that he was free of any input to that? Well, it could have been his relation with his mother. Well, I was thinking mm -hmm. about so. Beethoven, who probably was in Vienna in some of those uh, cafes, and uh, he loved Napoleon until I think Napoleon became a despot. Yeah. And but then he came up with the emperor, um, uh, the third, the Eroica Symphony. The gentleman. Yeah. Which the gentleman. I think is a very important uh, resonance um, that happened in the, the culture at that time. And I think that work of art stimulated are, a lot of political thinking how are, that how he was are these, expressing. How are these instances, the one you bring up, the one you're referring to now, how do they allow for free will? That's the question. Yeah, I, I'm just saying that in a dynamic system, I'm not sure whether this constant searching for is this true or is that true is even what we should be discussing. But I mean, would you, you, know? would you the, apply that to all of reality? The, the, the I actually would. I, I so would actually say that probably maybe hopefully, most of academia is going to dialogical inquiry, not monological inquiry. But are you saying, are you then saying that like there is no truth because like we can't ascertain it as, as opposed to what's not true? No, I, well I would say this, you could say that, well what did Wallace Stevens say? There are many truths but they are not parts of a truth. You could actually say that there are many patterns, if you want to talk about truths, so there are many laws, right. but is there anything that overarchingly accounts for all of yes. that? Yes. Yes, I would say certainly in the mystical traditions. In, in, in mystical, scientific, rational, and that's causality. Because you have to understand, the nature of reality, okay, the nature of everything, the universe, yeah. is that it changes. Change right. is, so I have no problem with that. So is, what's the big news there? About change the is the fundamental there. process right. of reality. Right. Change. Exactly. Change is one state going into another st state, it's a causal process. Right. So if change right. is the fundamental, essential process right. of the of entire reality, that is the fundamental pattern that you're searching for. And if causality is the fundamental pattern, there can be no free will. It would be impossible because the causality has already determined the reality. Yeah, but I, I think you, you're continuing to raise this question when all of us agreed with you from the beginning that there's conditioned well, what happens next? Uh, yeah. Well, what happens next? All right. The, the, what what happens next is like there are very um, negative, unfortunate circumstances that come from this illusion of free will. In other words, like when we oh, when we that. buy into the illusion of free will, somebody does something wrong, they're evil, they're bad, they deserve to be punished. You know. Whereas, what's the, what's the alternative? We understand that they were completely compelled to be behave the way they did. So we may have to take some kind of action, you know, um, to pr preserve civilization, society, whatever. But we would do it with understanding, yeah. with compassion. Yeah. yeah, I think, and again, no one would disagree with that. And, that. and that's a slightly different discussion in the sense that even that's what Ken Wilber says, too, is, you know, everything's a perspective on a perspective on a perspective. So everyone's partially right, everyone's partially wrong. So there's no reason to be dogmatic about it but all. Isn't, so. that a, isn't that a moral observation, yeah, though, that's a moral about observation. a scientific uh, law? Well, certainly, because the, the idea is that we... Not that know, those things have to be yeah. separate, but I do think you are, that's a statement of faith right. that you're making, So actually, which is what fine. I think yes. what you're really... But, you, but there's a difference between the science yeah. and the morality. All that right. You believe that science 
supports or doesn't support. Right. And I think that's a very crucial. No, you're, you're right. What, what I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that um, to the extent that we don't attribute um, um, our acts to ourselves, that we can create a much more harmonious world now. We have, we have centuries, we have millennia of evidence that the free will perspective um, leads to competition, leads to aggression, leads to violence, leads to hostility. You know, so, so at, at, at worst, at worst, we can try a new kind of um, understanding, which, which really is based on our most fundamental understanding of reality, based on the truth, and, and, and hopefully it'll work. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And I think all that is is a different statement. That That's a statement I think all of us would agree on, that we would say to everyone out there, that traditional ideas of free will have a pathology attached to them, which a more dynamic discussion can help us alleviate. But, mm -hmm. but truth is an idea that you act upon. So actions are required. And uh, that, I think, isn't something that you can decide ahead of time because there's always a situation that requires a moral response. And I don't think there's a, a, a pre-given, pre-programmed, pre-packaged response. For example? You need to be in that context, and there may be different levels I'm of sorry. morality operating. So no, me, no, me, what's your yeah, that's, I, that's actually, where paradox yeah. is so important that we be comfortable with paradox rather than to eliminate paradox and create a totalitarian world out um, of our utopian fantasy. But why, why would you refer to um, the, the issue of truth as totalitarian? We search for truth. That's what science is about. That's I'm what reason is about. I'm just saying truth is not something abstract that's outside of us no, no, that we is, obey, right. uh, something that we act upon. And it's not pre-given. Right. The, the pathologies that you said are being caused because of this uh, myth of free will. I, th I would like to quote, uh, read a quote from Hermann Goring. Of course, the people don't want war. But after all, it's the leaders of the country who determine the policy. And it's always a simple matter to drag people along, whether it's a democracy or a fascist dictatorship or a parliament or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders, this is easy. All you have to do is tell them that they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in every country. So, I mean, this is, when we talk about uh, pathologies and the myths behind human behavior, we have to address this concern. Why propaganda is so successful? If people have free will, why are they misled by their leaders? It, throughout history, the, it has been done, and it was recently done and it's going across the board. And if we have this notion that we are choosing things, uh, regardless of what, what causal conditions have been impinged upon us, we will never be able to solve these problems until and unless we change the causal conditions. And I think that's where uh, the, the truth of determinism really helps. Can we cause, can we create new patterns? And unfortunately, uh, they are not at work right now. The, the children across the planet are still reciting national anthems every day. We need planet anthems if we want to save the planet. And I think that's where the power of determinism helps. Well, you know, one thing, there's absolutely no doubt that in every dynamic situation there are counter momentums that are always at play. Mm -hmm. And so basically you're saying that there are counter momentums and every culture started from a subculture that was a small counter momentum within that larger momentum and somehow through then process, you know, ended up, you know, winning the day and becoming the story the narrative, the, the narrative that sold. Right now, they say the two big counter momentums in all of world consciousness are: do we serve the individual self and compete over the ac accumulation of external wants and needs, or do we actually develop a collective perspective, which in which we have a sense of providing for the well-being of everybody, and that these are two incredible counter momentums culturally, ethically, in consciousness, religiously, the two big ones that are at play right now and probably will determine whether we go down the drain by war, by competition, by resource, mm -hmm. uh, fighting over resources, polluting the planet, or whether there's enough a sense of the collective that people can sit down at a table and the collective well-being will actually be a, in a skillful discussion. 
So again, but th this is, again, nothing new because that, again, is, is causality. Causality in the point of cultural momentums, the momentums of discourse. But I'm just saying there's a felt sense rather than a predetermined uh, idea, set of ideas that I affiliate with that needs to be honored. Absolutely. Cause, and that felt sense sometimes doesn't feel happy. Yeah. It feels pain, grief, sadness, confusion, yeah. anger, rage, and that's all part of the mix. Right. And out of that, something new and novel may emerge yeah. that leads yeah. to actions. Right. There's a mm -hmm. great the historical world. example is when Attila... But the felt sense is important. Yeah. yeah. And, and this, this is such a great historical example. When Attila was coming down to lay siege to Rome, and Pope Leo went out to meet him, and there's the discussion that no one knows what was said, but Pope Leo walked into uh, Attila's tent without uh, any arms and everything, and they had a discussion. And Attila turned around and, w and went home. Now, this is ex saying, undoubtedly what went on in that conversation was a felt sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was something that went on between those two men of power mm -hmm. that allowed a recognition w uh, in them that I think was a recognition of respect. And that respect then required that Attila said, this is not a man I want to do harm to or to his people. Mm -hmm. Now, the rumors are that Leo reminded Attila of what the Chinese had done to the Mongols and said, that's actually what you would be doing to me. And that got a ka-ching, ka-ching. But see, that's, that's a tweak there. That is, <laughs> yeah. But it's so interesting that it's in the felt sense. Uh -huh. right, right, right. The field comes through the felt sense. And I think yeah. sometimes we get very dissociated and separate from that felt sense because of our uh, reliance upon the visual spatial. And I think it's the blending of the senses, the auditory, the kinesthetic, and the visual. Yeah. When we can integrate this, yeah. this interplay, uh, we are more connected to the field. Mm -hmm. But if we are disconnected, then what comes through is very distorted. But those distortions are absolutely, someone has to embody those distortions in order to get to another level and integrate them. Yeah, and going back to your example, it's really interesting, too, because of what you brought up about Garen. Let's think about Yalta, where you had Roosevelt. Churchill and Roosevelt coming from one... And Stalin, wasn't at, Stalin? Yeah, but the f point is that Stalin was not coming from that same felt sense. Right. Stalin was sitting there thinking Garen's thoughts. Here's two Mr. Nice Guys. I can certainly bamboozle them because I can sit here, I can have a drink with them, I can nod my head yes, and then I'm going to get all the concessions I want because when I go home I'm going to play by my own rules. So this is what's really interesting. That's kind of the, the historical crossroads of felt sense that actually becomes causal. Right. And culture. Yeah. Or is a culture. That's, of course, what they the were grounded in. Yes, right. Judeo-Christian values, which meant fair play. Right. And Gowrain, of course, see, he comes from, this is interesting, that what the Eastern sages say about, about people like Hitler and uh, Stalin, that they have a skewed form of awakening. And the skewed form of awakening is, I don't have to play by the rules, because there isn't really a system of ultimate rewards and punishments. So therefore, I can have these types of thoughts about how to beat the system. See, that's very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, you know, as well is, you know, what are the counter momentums historically of those two different types of causality, or where are they coming from? Of course, a lot of people, when they do this thing, it's called what uh, socio psychology of despots. And you go back to uh, Hitler and to Stalin and the, all the other people they studied, they all had very common childhoods. Mm -hmm. They all had domineering was fathers. And, right? they had and that's, that's the, the you know, important point, yeah, because we. Yeah. We have people um, in, our, in our history as a civilization who have done horrible things, and we develop this hatred for them. Naturally, um, I think what we hate um, truly is what they did, but then under, under the free will perspective, we actually hate the person. And if we can hate one person, then we can hate another person. If we can hate a person, we can hate a group. And when we hate groups, then we have this geopolitical um, threat of, of nuclear war, et cetera. But that's an ethical stance you're taking, right. not and a John, scientific one. Right, but that's, that, is, that is the reason why, I, John, let me finish. That is the reason why the um, transcending the, the illusion of free will is so important. Because from from all right from a from a rational scientific perspective, we can understand how 
it is an illusion. But then from a moralistic perspective, that's where we understand how, how completely relevant it is to our reality, to our civilization. Because like basically morality, goodness is what creates happiness, um, evil is what creates unhappiness or pain. So, so that that is the the relevance of, of the entire show to to really to really demonstrate how this isn't just a, a an esoteric academic question. This is a question that yeah. affects the yeah. entirety of our future. Mm -hmm. There's a whole basis in integral theory again by Ken Wilber where he says the same thing. So if this is where we're getting, and I'm happy with it because, you know, he also says the same thing. He says that because of the evolutionary baggage we carry, which is to protect our individual right to survive and, and reproduce, we have this thing that he calls myth of the given, and myth of the given is that our point of view is correct. Our point of view is normative, and the other person's point of view is not normative. But from the integral point of view, much as you said, you walk into a room and you start with the understanding, everyone here will think they're right, Everyone here will think that what they've been given is the truth. Let's take that as a given, because that's what we've brought with our evolutionary baggage. And given that understanding, let's have a different discussion. So I, I like that, because there's nothing more about, you know, your idea of there being no free will than Ken Wilber saying everyone's going to walk into the room thinking they're right, and let's start from there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We have a little Talk over a minute left. No, we, last thoughts? Uh, okay, so I just want to read uh, this quote from Mark Twain, if you know a man's nationality, you can come within a split hair of guessing the complexion of his, re his religion. And when you know the man's religious complexion, you know what sort of religi religious books he reads, and when he wants some more light, and what sort of books he avoids, lest by accident he get more light than he wants. Uh, so what Mark Twain is pointing out, I do witness it in the library, that you know the developmental levels, whether one is egocentric, ethnocentric, or world-centric, determine what we read, and also our identities, whether we are Muslims, Christians, or Jews. So if we have free will, uh, we could transcend that. But unfortunately, for centuries, we see the same patterns in culture. And this is determined by massive propaganda from all sides. And I think this is time in history that human beings have to go beyond the propaganda, have to start asking new questions, have to go beyond the books of the tribe. And that's okay, all that I would like to say. we've got about 10 seconds. <laughs> thank you, Nomi. Thank you, John. Thank you, Kurt. Um, in the future, we'll explore other topics related to the nature of human will. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much. It was wonderful. Thank you.